Today on BRS TV, we're going to go over calcium reactors. We'll go over the basic theory, discuss some of the benefits, the basics behind setting one up, and we'll offer a few tips at the end. This type of reactor has been around a very long time and been used successfully in countless reef aquariums. If ever there was a tried and proven method of maintaining calcium and alkalinity, this is it. This is also an equipment junkie's dream come true. If installing and tinkering with equipment is half the fun of owning a tank, a calcium reactor might be the best solution for you. The concept behind how it works is fairly simple. We have a container filled with old coral skeleton pieces, water, and a pump designed to keep the water circulating constantly. We inject small amounts of carbon dioxide into the container to lower the pH to a point where the surface of the old coral skeleton begins to dissolve into its original elements, which are predominantly calcium and carbonate. We then drip the solution filled with these elements back into the tank, where they can be used by the new corals for growth. In some ways, it seems like one of the more natural sources of calcium and alkalinity you can find. And since we're dissolving the entire skeleton, it's fairly safe to presume that we're also adding many of the trace elements the old coral took up with its natural growth. However, it's unlikely to be a complete trace element solution because it won't include all of the elements utilized by the soft tissue or the symbiotic algae which feeds the corals known as zooxanthellae. Setting up a reactor is fairly simple. Each manufacturer will have their own instructions and features, so you should read them, but this is basically how it should work. You will need to get some CO2. If you purchased a container, it was most likely shipped to you empty, and you'll need to get it filled. This can be done at paintball fields, welding supplies, home brewing stores, or even some of the larger sporting goods suppliers. Before you go, you might want to call them and ask if they offer refill service or just a tank swap. If you just purchased a shiny brand new tank, you probably want to get it refilled rather than swap it out for an old beat up version. While you're there, ask for some safety tips on dealing with CO2 in your home. For instance, you don't want to put a tank next to something hot like a radiator. It should be used vertically and checking for leaks is critical because CO2 is a colorless, odorless gas that can be dangerous to your health. Next, select your media of choice. Rinse it in some fresh water, preferably filter water like RODI. Add the media to the main reactor chamber. If the reactor has them, fill the additional chambers as well. Fill your bubble counter with clean, fresh water. If your reactor has a probe port, insert and secure your pH probe. Connect your regulator to the CO2 tank as well as the tubing from the regulator to the bubble counter. Next, connect your water feed pump. This is often something small like an aqualifter, but it can be smaller power heads as well. We typically recommend against using peristolic dosing pumps because there's going to be a valve on the output which restricts the flow. Using a dosing pump will result in increased pressure which can damage the pump or result in leaks. Most aquarium dosing pumps are also known as intermittent duty and not designed to be run all day every day. Next open the water valve, plug in the feed pump and allow the reactor to fill with water. Once it's full we're ready to start tuning the reactor. Tuning is basically adjusting the pH inside the reactor and the volume of solution added to the tank so that it matches the amount of calcium and alkalinity consumed by the corals in the tank. While I wouldn't call it hard, it can be a tricky process and takes a bit of practice. Each manufacturer will have different suggestions on how to do this, so check the directions, but these are the basics behind how to tune your reactor. Most reactors are going to suggest that you operate them anywhere between 6.3 and 7.5, with the most common range being between 6.5 and 6.7. We can control the pH in two ways. First, by adjusting the CO2 bubble count. Higher the bubble count, the lower the pH will be. After each adjustment, wait a few hours and test the pH of the effluent coming out of the reactor. Second, we can control the pH with a pH controller or aquarium controller. This will use the pH probe located on the top of the reactor to automatically open and close a solenoid valve on the CO2 regulator to keep the pH inside an ideal range. We suggest using both options with the bubble count being your primary control and the pH controller as your backup. The goal is now to adjust the drip rate of the solution coming from the reactor to match the rate at which your corals consume these elements. We suggest starting at the low end of the manufacturer's guidelines and working your way up. More or less, use your test kits. If the levels are going up, tune the reactor down. If they're dropping, tune it up. 
One thing to keep in mind is the CO2 bubble rate and the effluent drip rate of the solution leaving the reactor don't operate completely independently, but more so in relation to each other. Because the water from your tank entering the reactor is a much higher pH, if we increase the flow rate, it will raise the pH within the reactor, so you'll have to add more CO2 to maintain the same pH within the reactor. So there are two basic ways to increase or decrease the amount of calcium and alkalinity added to the tank. First is adjust the pH between 6.3 and 7.5. The lower the pH, the faster you'll melt the media. Second is increase the drip rate of the fluent from the reactor so more solution is added to the tank. Now that might have all sounded fairly complex, but really, once you do it for yourself, it's much easier than it seems. Either way, right now the gear junkie in you is thinking, oh, this sounds super cool and I can't wait to get started. Or you're thinking, wow, that sounds like a lot more work than I'm ready for. If that's the case, take a look at using two-part or possibly Kalkwasser. They're not as much fun, but they can be much easier to understand and use. We do have a few additional tips. We've been talking about the media as old coral skeleton, but it really comes in a wide variety of forms. From tiny pieces of coral commonly referred to as reef bones, to calcium carbonate based gravel or other materials. Carib C is an industry leader and stocks their media in three different sizes. The smallest material will have the highest surface area and be capable of providing the highest concentrations of calcium and alkalinity. However, the smaller particles will clog the easiest as well. For this reason, we suggest using the coarse or extra coarse if possible. Two Little Fishes is well known for their reborn media, which is the tiny pieces of coral we've been talking about for most of this video. For obvious reasons, this is a very popular option as well. Earlier I mentioned that melting old coral skeleton is likely to not only add calcium and alkalinity, but also some trace elements, which for many people is a primary reason they use a calcium reactor. However, that also means it will include other elements which are part of the biological process or part of the coral's environment, which we might not want, like phosphate or other contaminants. Fish food will still be the single largest source of phosphate to the tank, but many people like to manage the introduction of phosphate anywhere they can. For this purpose, there are some premium brands of media like the Calpure from Elos, which is phosphate and nitrate free. This type of media claims to be surface treated to increase porosity and solubility of the media for better performance. I think as time goes on, medias like this will become more and more popular because the purity of any material going into the aquarium is pretty critical. There's also a magnesium media you can mix in, which most people believe to be high quality sources of dolomite. Both Fauna Marin and KZ sell very popular versions of this material. One thing to consider regardless of the brand of reactor or media you select is you'll be dripping a low pH solution into your tank, so we'll drop the pH to some degree. The second or even third chamber found on many reactors is designed to increase the pH of the effluent, but it's pretty typical for tanks running a calcium reactor to maintain a pH of around 7.8. Because of this, it's pretty common to also add some redundancy to the system with your aquarium controller by monitoring the pH of the tank and turning off the reactor's feed pump if the tank ever drops too low. Every piece of equipment will fail at some point, so it's redundancy like this that results in a long-term successful reef tank. That wraps up today's episode. This week's question of the week is, what is your favorite brand of calcium reactor and type of media? If you have any good tips on using that reactor, share them with the community. Next week's episode will be focusing on aquarium controllers. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to be notified when it comes out. Thank you for watching BRS TV.